I remember so very well as I draw to the conclusion of my intervention when John Garang de Mabior was leading the SPLA, SPLM, he always argued that I do not want to divide Sudan. I want Sudan to remain one, but he asked the Arabs, why is it that within Sudan you want to make us Muslims? You want to make us Arabs? Wasn't God wise enough when he created us black-skinned? Wasn't he wise enough when he gave us a different form of spirituality? Is the God that we worship not a God of diversity? Why can't we live in Sudan where we celebrate unity in diversity? John Garang, the Mabior pose. And he said, if you want us to be in Sudan, make unity attractive. If you make unity destructive, then we must pass our ways because sometimes it's in parting our ways that we retain our friendship. I am submitting that not only here but Africa has a case particularly during this year of silencing the guns of holding very serious conversations around the rights of the people. When you see people are agitated, it means that something is itching them. They are dissatisfied. They think they are being treated like stepchildren. They think they are being treated like second class citizens or even third class citizens, and they want to be at the dinner table. They do not want to see people at the dinner table, and they themselves are consigned to a little corner in the dining room. They want to be part of the package. They want to be present where decisions are made. And I think that that is what must happen if Africa is to avoid the path of war, the path of civil war, the path of uncontrolled breakages. It can be done. It must be done for the sake of African unity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. You spoke well. I am happy and delighted to be in the studio with you. Hello viewers, kindly tell us your name and where you are viewing us from. Send in your question from the comment section. Prof, from what you said, I would like to ask you some questions from what our viewers have been saying. You are of the view of uh, renegotiation in Nigeria. When you mentioned the Oduduwas, the Biafrans, and the Arewas. How can this be possible? Because we know that in 2014, there is a conference. Of such a conference has not been implemented till now in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. What is your suggestion to that person? My view is My Nigeria is not the only country that will be renegotiating. Whenever you see countries getting into constitution making processes, that is a renegotiation. You are familiar, for example, and I'm giving these examples because Nigeria does not stand alone and you draw examples from other experiences. Go to a country like Belgium, a country like Belgium where you have a large French speaking population and a Flemish population. And what they have done is to ensure that these units enjoy autonomy in critical areas and the center exists only for purposes of defense, sometimes policing and coordinating policy. And the fact that in the past things have been done and have not been done properly does not mean that they cannot be done. Because let me ask you, how old is the Nigerian state as we know it now? I gave you the example of Switzerland deliberately because the idea of negotiating Switzerland started in the 13th century and is still being negotiated in the 21st century. You've got to look at all these things from an intergenerational perspective. If you want to see these things resolved in your lifetime, then you will be disappointed. Countries renew themselves and from generation to generation, interests are defined and i think the fact that you have failed once is not sufficient to say that this thing has failed it must be done again and again the countries that we now admire like the united states of america how did they negotiate their country 
It started in, in Philadelphia in 1776, when those who assembled in Philadelphia in 1776 were saying, behold this truth to be self-evident, that all men are born equal, that they are endowed by their creator with sudden and unlimited rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Did they include the blacks? No, they did not. Did they include women? They did not. There were only 13 states. And even when that was had, had been done, the United States of America went into a civil war, a part of a very violent renegotiation of their country. And even beyond that, after the emancipation in 1863, the Africans of color, until 1963 in places such as Alabama, Africans could not vote. They were renegotiating the country. And even up till now, when George Floyd was saying, I cannot breathe, we are still renegotiating the country. Nigeria is only 60. The Nigerian state that we know now is slightly over 60 years. That is a very short time historically, and we cannot afford the luxury of impatience. We must be patient, and we must know that this is intergenerational. And when you recognize the intergenerationality of this particular matter, then you know that you cannot afford the luxury of impatience. There is another question from one of our viewers on Facebook. I will read it from the screen now. He said, Prof, what is going on to be done in African continent? Are we going to be continent which receives proposals of how we govern ourselves from European masters or African? Prof, what is your suggestion to this? Our problem as Africa is low self-esteem. And if you want to know how troubled we are, just look at how Africans were behaving during the elections in the United States. Particularly the Africans who have gone to school, you think that they are American. Right now, they are busy trying to identify the home of Kamal Harris. Some are saying she's Nigerian, some are saying she's Australian. All those are attributes of low self-esteem. And I want you to look at the manner in which the Chinese have responded, the manner in which the Russians have responded, the manner in which the Arabs have responded. Africans have behaved as if the elections in the United States of America is their very own. This feel-good effect are attributable to our low self-esteem. If Africa is to be in charge of our affairs, Africans must believe that they are as good as anybody else. But as long as we don't believe in our institutions, we don't believe in ourselves, we'll always be looking to the United Kingdom, we'll always be looking to France. Look at a number of organizations in, in, in the world today. If you ask me, the Commonwealth, which is created by the British, is it not just an organization that makes the British still feel that they control an empire? That is why the head of the Commonwealth is the queen or the monarch at all times. Is it not the case that the French still want to believe that they are an empire? That is why they have an organization that puts together all former French colonies. Is it not the case that the Portuguese also feel that they still want to appear as if they control Angola and Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde? The only way is to do what some African leaders were saying very early on. Let us unite and have our activities being undertaken by ourselves. There have been initiatives which are very good on paper, but we are poor on implementation. The Lagos Plan of Action of 1908, which says, let us trade with one another so that we generate our own income. In the Africa Agenda 2063, which says that we should de-emphasize trade or rather control by other institutions. Africa Continental Free Trade Area, which will begin to operate in the month of January next year in Accra, Ghana. These are things that if we built on them, and we started building institutions in Africa, we can then be strong and we can relate to the world and we'll have to we'll believe in ourselves. 
It is a question of exercising the ghost of low self-esteem and young men and women who are present in this assembly. It is a dedication that you must take. When you meet Koreans, they are proud of being Korean. When you meet Japanese, they are proud of being Japanese. When you meet Chinese, they are proud of being Chinese. When you meet Arabs, they are proud of being Arabs. But we in Africa, we kind of apologize. And permit me to say, these fellows were so pernicious that they even encouraged us that we must bleach our skins in order for us to survive. We must change because if we don't change, we'll always, as Marcelo Caetano said of Portugal, Marcelo Caetano, who was the prime minister of Portugal when he was asked, and what is the role of black men? He said, the black man's only contribution to civilization is a hewer of wood and drawer of water. We must do things to say that that cannot possibly be true. It is our duty. It is our solemn duty. It is our patriotic duty. Thank you, Prof. I enjoy your well depth of knowledge. I know nobody has a monopoly of knowledge, but hearing you speak, one can actually talk with emphasis and references. Prof, one more question is this. What has been the role of the African Union towards the nemesis, towards the happenings in the African country, Nigeria in particular? What role has the AU, the African Union, played while seeing the peaceful protesters being slaughtered in the streets of Nikki? You know, the AU, I remember myself uh, tweeting and, and writing to the chairman of the AU when there were killings in Lekki, Nigeria. The AU was quiet. ECOWAS was quiet. The international community was quiet. And that is understandable. This is a boys' club. They don't want to harm the other because the DNA of most African leaders is to behave in exactly the same way. And that is why the AU must be reformed. It is an organization that must be reformed so that its membership and its leadership is controlled by men and women who believe in this continent. As presently constituted, the AU is beholden to China and France. The AU, head, AU headquarters itself is built by the Chinese. The AU, the, the building adjoining it is built by the German half of her budget is financed from European Union and European NGOs, you cannot. There is an old English saying, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Africa must begin to pay for the things that define her pride. We should pay for the AU and make it an organization which is present in the minds and hearts of people. Otherwise, they do nothing. Look at the manner in which leaders responded to what was happening in Nigeria. Very muted comments. People did not even want to analyze the situation and understand the situation. Painful. Right now, as we talk, even what is happening in Ethiopia, they are doing nothing, and that is, in the, that is where the headquarters is located. They have just given a statement which is very lukewarm. So on a scale of 1 to 10, the AU performs at a miserable three out of 10. Thank you, Prof. Prof, one more question is this. When you talk about renegotiation of uh, the Nigerian as a country, I think what I understood from your speech is that the federal system of government in Nigeria should allow other states or regions or provinces to enjoy monopoly, to handle their resources effectively. What do you think has been the greatest challenge of the Nigerian government to implement this into law? You know, if the Nigerian federal constitution were allowed to thrive in its full splendor, Nigeria would be totally different. I'm speaking, one may say I'm an armchair analyst, but Experience from other parts of the world demonstrate that if you allow a federal structure to work so that regions have autonomy in terms of their resources, they have autonomy in terms of policing, they have autonomy in terms of the labor that they deal with, they have 
autonomy in terms of their taxation, they become more efficient and the center only becomes a lean mean coordinating center that is in charge of defense, that is in charge of foreign policy and in, is in charge of defining and uniform policy position so that the federal government is a very lean mean body. And you see that in many countries. Look at Germany, for example, with the 16 landers. Each of the landers enjoys autonomy almost up to 80%. You go to Spain, which still has problems, but you go to places, components such as the Basque country, which collect 100% of the taxes and remit only 17% to the Madrid government. What should happen is that in the process of the renegotiation of the state, you'll have to look at the situation, what one would describe as a SWOT analysis, and ask yourself, if we have oil in the Delta region, how does the Delta region benefit? Of course, it is a natural resource that should be available to the entire Nigeria, but the place where it sits should have something over and above everybody else. So that when somebody goes into that area, somebody says, yes, there is oil in this area. Look at the infrastructure. Look at the schools. Look at the health system. Look at agriculture. Look at the incomes. And one says, yes, this looks at it. And you go to Kaduna and you go there and you find that there is cotton, uh, the, the, the textile industries and the leather industry. And you go there and you see thriving leather industry, shoes being made, the Agbadas being made in that area. You go to Southern Nigeria where there is mining and you see something is happening so that the components of the state are thriving and the center becomes stronger. But if the center becomes a parasitic center, which sucks blood out of the regions, then the regions will become dissatisfied and the regions will think sometimes wrongly that they would be better if they broke away from the body. But yet, if they remained as one whole, where resources are shared, where necessary equally and where necessary equitably, then everybody would be happier in that way. And when I talk about renegotiation, I'm talking about a constitutional architecture that looks at the reality on the ground, that is cognizant of the historical injustices and addresses those historical injustices that looks to the future and looks to creating a glue that builds bridges rather than create barriers. And that is what I am putting on the table, not only for Nigeria, but for many African countries which are finding themselves in conflictual situations. Thank you, Prof. There is one question from one of our viewers from the- Which Facebook. will be my last question. To <laughs> Prof, you said young people are not active in political decision and planning in most African countries. They are excluded and said they are tomorrow's leader. Any advice on African youth future in political participation and inclusion, particularly in Nigeria also, what do you think that has been the problem? We are the young Nigerians are not... I don't believe in this leadership of tomorrow. I believe that leadership is co-generational. It is the duty of older people to work side by side with younger people and when they do that, it is your own great writer, Chinua Achebe, who in one of his books said, when mother cow is chewing cud, baby cow watches and knows how it is done. So when the older people are governing, they should have younger people understanding them. Ask yourselves, when you talk about youth, how old was Nambi Azikiwe in 1960? How old was Tafawa Balewa? They were in their 30s. Some of them, they were in their 20s. People like Modibo Keita, they were in their 20s and in their 30s. People like Patrice Emery Lumumba. This idea that old people in their 70s are the ones who ought to lead is something that just came about because African leaders did not know when to leave the stage. But in the early years of the struggle for independence is the young people who are at the forefront and is, in the, is the duty of young people to organize. History has demonstrated not once, not twice, but times without number 
that fortune favors those who are organized. You cannot win a lottery if you don't buy the lottery ticket. You cannot get into power and positions of influence by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting without action is superstition. You must pray and fast, but also do things that are moving you in the direction because even the divine instruction is by the sweat of thy brow and as they say in Kiswahili if you want anything under the bed you must bend you don't say of shoes under the bed arise and come to my feet 